Hello, this is Will Faber from Art to Ride, and today we're doing the first session with Orion. Now, the name of this particular video is called How to Train a Frisian, and of course that's a little bit of a trick question because the answer is you train it just like any other horse. This is a three-and-a-half-year-old Frisian who's come to me. Uh, he had been started on the lunge line. It's the only thing he's ever done, but unfortunately he had learned to spin around on the lunge line, which meaning to flip in the opposite direction when you're least expecting it. And while you probably can't tell that much from here, because the camera's uh, pretty far away from the, from the horse here, this is a very big horse, and he's only three and a half years old and very powerful. So uh, his owner had tried to start him, and uh, happily she brought him to us before this got too far, but he had learned to flip around with her on the lunge line, which meaning, meaning to suddenly spin in the opposite direction from the way you're trying to go. So you can see here, I give him a little tap with the whip, and uh, you know he's also got that issue of wanting to spin on you, and point his hindquarters. That's what I tell people when they're trying to spin, see how this horse is going with the hindquarters to the inside all the time. They're basically trying to load their guns to get against you, so to speak, just as they would in nature. If you watch horses in a pasture, how they will come up and threaten each other, you know, and one backs down generally. Well, that's what the horse is doing when it's trying to see how this horse is trying. He's trying to flip around to the right all the time like this. I leave this in here so you guys can see this. So that's why you never want to teach horses to flip around on the end of a lunge line because pretty soon they'll be flipping around when you don't want them to, which is what this horse had learned. And of course, they become impossible to lunge once they do that and they really take over control from you. So why it doesn't look that dramatic here, this horse is, you know, he's not, he's just in a halter cavison. So he's a very big horse and the kind of horse that just kind of walks over the top of you when he's big Frisians. So it's taking me some a little bit of effort there and strength to keep him from spinning around on me. You see how I'm just, the, the line is light, but as soon as he tries to spin on me, I have to give and take as hard as I can in order to get him to keep from spinning out. You see how he starts to bring the nose to the outside there. That's him trying to spin around on me. So once again, this is just the first day I've worked this horse, and you can see how he's going rather hollow, head up in the air, in a typical sort of Frisian manner. Now, the reason I was so excited to get this horse in training, A, to start with one that has never done anything at all, so you guys can see how quickly it is, uh, how easy it is to train a horse that's never been trained badly. You know, so many of you are riding horses that have been really damaged, and I salute you all for doing so, as we do all the time, and bringing them along. But I just wanted to show you how much easier it is with a horse that hasn't already learned, that hasn't already learned to drop its back away from the rider. So you can see here, with just a few moments of lunging, how he's already starting to bring his neck in head and neck down and forward, which is very common for most horses. It's people that stop horses from stretching. Uh, almost every horse I've ever worked with in my life, as a young horse, if you start them to, uh, going forward and teach them to lunge correctly, they immediately want to go into the stretch because that's the way they can do the work most, most comfortably. So that's the position they want to go into. But if people, of course, complicate that issue by uh, putting side reins on horses and all these different various things that keep them from being able to stretch down, you know, with the erroneous idea that because a horse's head and neck is down, that it's on the forehand. Of course, as we all know, that just facilitates the back coming through and has very little to do with whether the horse is on the forehand or not. The only thing that makes a difference about that is whether the horse is over its back. A horse not over its back, as you've all heard me say many times, is always on the forehand, no matter how high it brings its knees up. But getting back to Orion here, he's a lovely horse. We're really excited about it. I think you'll see... Uh, We've, he's been here for two months, so what I'm going to show you here over this particular video is an entire, you know, sort of uh, encapsulated uh, training program for the last two months that we've done with this horse, bringing him up to being mounted. So that's what we're going to see today. So you can see now how he's starting to at least start to relax. If you look how much deeper already the hind legs are tracking under the body. And he's already, you can see his head just wanting to go down, trying to find a more comfortable place. Now this is a pretty small pen. Uh, for a horse of this size to be lunging, but because of the fact that he'd learned to spin out, lunging him in an open arena uh, would have been very, very difficult to start with um, because he would just try to spin right out from you all the time. And this is a very strong, powerful horse who, you know, without any kind of bridle or anything else, even just um, with a cavison noseband, you know, was, was really not enough to make a major impression on him. And you'll see how when he tries to spin a few times that I, you know, I have to give and take on the rein pretty hard a couple of times to keep him from getting away from me. But once again, you can see how he's also already starting to stretch. As you see that neck throughout the walk and trot, just beginning to come down. But once again, look how high the head is. Look how the hind legs are being left out behind. And of course, the fate of so many Frisian horses, you know, my wife Karen is a saddle fitter, and I've gone with her a few times, um, having been with her when she's gone to fit Frisians. And 
seeing them at horse shows, and I'm always struck at how completely upside down most of them are and how completely hollow they are. For the one basic reason that a lot of people make the mistake of thinking just because a horse is big that it's strong. Well, yes, it's strong, yes, but its back is not strong. The heavier the horse is itself, you know, the, the more work we need to get their backs up because the weight of the body themselves are will basically draw the back down on a horse of this size, any of these kind of draft horses. And of course, any other kind of a lighter horse, but it happens faster with these kind of big, heavy, heavy bodied horses. Well, you can see with him how he's already begun here to draw his belly up, you know, so that's not hanging down as it was when I first started him. And he's starting to get into the stretch. So once again, you know, a Frisian horse is trained just like any other horse. And I've had so many people tell me, oh, they're not built like that, and they have to have their heads up in the air. But, you know, once again, that is just not true at all, and that's how they all end up so completely sway back. You know, unfortunately, a lot of very heavy people buy these big kind of horses thinking that, you know, they're big enough to carry them. But once again, the reality is, you know, yes, they would be if they trained them correctly and got their backs up and really strong before they got on them, but in most cases, they do not. And once again, as soon as you put you know extra weight on top of a horse like this, their backs even collapse even more. And especially if you hold the head up, it's going to collapse entirely. So it's why we see the fate of so many Frisian horses ending up the way they do, which is sway backed. Of course, that's the fate of so many dressage horses and jumpers today as well. But it even you know we see it even more prevalent in these kind of big heavy breeds that people are trying to. Uh, to train and who are training them improperly and putting too much weights in their backs. So we can now see here now, even this first session, how he's starting to stretch down. He's sort of given up the idea of spinning on me here now. And look how, more, uh, how much more rhythmic the trot's beginning to come. And while he's still coming up and down, you can see him trying to find his own balance like that. And that's what we're looking for. And of course, we want to reward that. When the horse is correct, we do nothing at all. So when he's getting in the right frame and cruising along, which is how we get horses ultimately to be in the zone. So again, when we talk about if you're, if you're constantly putting pressure on horses against the mouth or you're constantly kicking them or gripping with your legs, you know, the horse is going to begin to resist that and it's going to always think it's being punished. So that's why it's so important, you know, when, whenever a horse is doing something correct, you do nothing at all. You can see right there how he tries to spin out on me again. But it's getting easier to send him forward now. And once again, you can see how the stretch is coming better. But you can see how also he's still trying to counter flex to the outside. Now, once again, that's that dual thing of him trying to spin on me, but also trying to load his guns against me. That is by swinging his hindquarters toward me so he can kick out at me, you know, if he sees uh, me as tr trying to dominate him, so to speak, which is what horses do to themselves. But that's why classical dressage is based on this basic principle of getting a horse to move forward. That's why when we touch him with a whip, we touch him in that fleshy area right behind the buttocks, which if you ever watch horses in pasture, that's just what they will do. They'll come up, if you ever see a stallion with, with uh, mares, they come up and they bite them and they move them around like that by sending them forward, so to speak, and away from them. And when horses submit you know, to whoever they think is the uh, alpha horse, so to speak, they yield their hindquarters. In other words, they unload the guns and say, okay, well, I'm not going to try to fight you anymore, you know. And that's basically what we're doing on a lunge line. Now, when I work a young horse like this one, what we've done, I haven't taken him to the cross ties first. I've gone to his stall, you know, and I've gotten him tacked up in the stall, and I've taken him directly out to this uh, pen to work. Now, once he gets done with the work, then I would take him over the cross ties and ask him to stand still. But so many people make the mistake of young horses is, you know, they're, they're worried about whether they're standing still in the cross ties and they're making them stand there for an hour before they go to work them. You know, and the most important thing with the young horses is just to realize that they have very short attention spans, you know, and if they get excited, you know, there's no foundation of control. So if they get excited, things often go wrong. So that's why we're very careful about putting horses in things like, uh, you know, um, standing stalls and this kind of thing, you know, where they're standing in the, in the cross ties tied because, you know, some, if something sets them off and they have an accident at a young age, it will kind of blow their minds for the future. So we have to be sure that we take every step. So I take my, my young horses, I tack them up wherever they live, I bring them directly to where I'm going to work, and then I would take them to the cross ties and do whatever work I'm going to do there. Very often, um, now, this horse is not a nervous type horse, but with the more nervous ones, if they're jumpy at all, I would never put them in cross ties. I would have somebody stand there and just hold them while they just get used to the idea of being there for a while before we actually hook up um, those cross ties to them because we have seen so many horses, you know, if they get excited in cross ties and I've seen horses flip over on the, in, in them and every kind of accident you can possibly see over the years. So we want to take our time in expecting horses to just go right to cross ties and stand there still. 
But now, once again, I gave him a little break, and you can see how we're coming back here, and the stretch is starting to happen again. Every time I come back to it, it's a little better, though he's still trying to swing his hindquarters at me a little bit. And this is about the longest session. This session lasted about 25 minutes or so, and this is about as long as I would ever lunge a horse, in other words. I, but I have to get all the way there the first time, that is, just to get him to not necessarily um, stay consistent in the stretch, which I wouldn't expect on the first day of work, but just that he starts experimenting with that and that he simply yields away from my whip and moves to the outside of the circle, or out to the rail in this case. And that's just what I'm looking for. So I do a little bit of trot and come right back to the walk and go right back to where he can begin to stretch again. But once again, the point of me showing you this is so you can see just how easily this works with young horses. You know, we don't have to tie their heads down. We simply have to reward them. So, for instance, what I do with a young horse, as soon as I see him, for instance, in any gait, starting to stretch a little bit, I'm going to come back to what came before. Like when I saw him starting to stretch a little bit in the, in the trot, I know he's ready to probably be there in the walk. And you can see how he's doing here now. He's already starting to stretch into it. Even though he's still coming up and down, it's not consistent yet, but he's finding that position more and more, like you see there. And, of course, that's what I'm always going to reward. I'm going to stop when I get to that position even if it's only in the walk. So if I've tried the trot and get, got, not gotten the horse exactly where I want him to be, I'm simply going to come back to the walk. I'm always going to end on that best possible note. It's always surprising to see when you see these Frisians that we're, we're, uh, we're used to seeing with their kind of hind legs out behind them in this exaggerated high head position. But as you see here, as he starts to stretch into the contact, how sort of more normal his frame is starting to look. You know, once again, all these horses that have been bred with these kind of real big sloping shoulders and big necks that come straight out of the body, you know, they've been bred that way to, so that they look like something, like a saddle bred is built like that, so that they can just crank the neck over and so the head and neck looks like something. And sadly, we've seen uh, the dressage go down that same route where people are simply, you know, I ask people what round is and uh, one girl once told me that her, tr her trainer told me to hold against the mouth of the horse until the middle of the neck popped up and that's when the horse was round. So, you know, with people being told things like this, it's no wonder that, you know, dressage has become such a mess that it is today. But happily, we're, ge we're beginning to see so much um, pushback in the other direction. I just saw where the Western uh, Dressage Federation or organization there has... Uh, passed a mandate that if your horse is behind the bit, you can't, can't, horse, can't score higher than a four on any movement. And that's exactly how, how it should be. And that's how dressage got into such a mess, is we have a lot of very uneducated judges, even though they go through this very expensive, expensive judges program, very few of them seem to be able to know whether a horse is over its back or not, or whether it's really on the forehand, or whether it's just lifting its knees up. But once again, I, I really applaud the Western organization for taking a stand and saying if your horse is behind the bit, you can't score higher than a four. And that's really what it should be. Remember, when you score dressage, it's it's one through uh, ten, right? Five meaning sufficient. So, in other words, any movement that's done without the horse over his back is going to be insufficient. Taking a moment here to clean up the uh, corral here which is always a good idea, you know, you'll see us very often uh, picking up, you know, especially if you have your own uh, barn and your own rings, it's really a good idea to uh, pick up the manure out of it as your ring and your sand will stay better much longer and your ring will be much less slippery. But unfortunately, when, you know, when people never pick up the manure out of riding arenas, it all just continually gets ground into the dirt. And that's why we end up, you know, then all of a sudden people wonder, well, why is my sand arena muddy all of a sudden? Well, you've been letting, you know, <laughs> Uh, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 or however many horses a day um, go to the bathroom in there and then grind all that up. So you're going to create problems. So it's always a good idea to clean up after it, as well as the bacteria. So if you're in a situation, especially with your own barn where, where everybody's doing it, it really does help, to help the, uh, the footing stay good for a longer time. So you can see how there, and so he's, this is my first time going this direction, how he's a little bit confused, he wants to spin in. And once again, that's why we always want to just go in one direction, you know, bring the horse to a halt, go to the horse, and change direction. So you see me having to tug pretty hard on that. Once again, this horse is just in a halter, kind of cavison, training cavison kind of thing, and he's a very big horse who had just learned to kind of walk over people, so to speak, or he wants to go to the left, he just takes you to the left. So. You can see there when he tried to spin out, I have to pull pretty hard on that rein just to keep him from doing that. 
Once again, now that's a problem that I would rather not see had he never been started, you know, before and learned that I wouldn't be going through this. But, you know, that's why it's so important. I do suggest that most people starting young horses, you know, should be doing it in some kind of round pin or at least a small square rectangular pin. So, you know, you've got some corners you can use if you need them, that not just out in the middle of a field. Now, I have personally trained many, many horses out in the middle of the field to lunge and this sort of thing um, when I was a trainer for a family in Unionville doing hunt horses. They didn't believe in having riding arenas in, the, in hunt country. So you had to do everything just out in the field. You had to lunge them, back them, and everything else to keep going. So, But believe me, it's a, a lot easier if you have a nice round pen to work in. You know, especially if you're not, you know, a lot of experience at this, the round pen can really help you uh, get behind the horse and keep it focused moving forward without it spinning away from you. Once again, you see how he's trying to do that. And he pretty much had learned this in both directions. One, one direction, he was worse than the other. But once again, you can see when he goes with his head up here, how the hind legs kind of fall out behind. Once again, we're always watching the back end of the horse, always remembering that whatever we do uh, in terms of the position of the head and neck, if it has an ill effect on the movement of the horse itself, then we, it's not any good. So uh, in other words, position that destroys movement has real no value in riding. But unfortunately, we've gotten more and more into that these days, is that you know, people are all into the head and neck set. But once again, I, I also warn the, old, the uh, people thinking about this thing of, you know, whether the horse is behind the bridle or not does not necessarily mean that it's, it's uh, over its back or not over its back. Um, you can bring a horse's head up and not overflex it and can still be perfectly hollow. You know, so we have to be sure that we not only understand that we don't want horses to be behind the vertical, but we have to understand why. You can see him try to pull out there a little bit with once more. But once again, this is only the first session with this horse, and you can see him already beginning to stretch down with no side reins or anything else on him, which is always how I start a horse. I never start horses with anything on them other than you know, some protective boots, and uh, I usually start them in a halter or cavison or lunging halter, so to speak. I would never want to take contact with the bit. Now, here in a few days, we'll have started putting a bit on him and letting him carry it. And now, fortunately, with this horse, he was a horse that just took to right to having a bit in his mouth. It was no problem at all. Within a day, he was, his lips were closed and, and uh, foaming, and I was able to begin to work him, as you'll see as we go into previous lessons with this horse. Right there, you can see how he tries to pull in. What he's trying to do is pull in so that he can make a fast turn to the outside. So you, you see me having to pull pretty hard there to, to keep him from doing that. Once again, this is a big horse, and so watch what happens here. That's once again him trying to spin out from me, how quick you have to be to send him forward. Because once again, until I get over that, the same thing here. You can see how he tried to load his guns against me. And he I got away with the flip that time. So now you watch what I'm going to do here. I just come over and just change him back in the other direction. But once again, I, I'm never going to stop until he just goes around the ring quietly and stops doing that in this particular day. But you can once again see how hard I'm having to pull once in a while to keep him from actually spinning out from underneath me. So that's really what this whole first lesson is about with this horse, is just getting him to move forward, stop trying to spin around, and move ahead of the whip. And if I get that, I would be happy with this in the day. Now, once again, you can see how he's already trying to find the stretch there on his own. That's very normal. Most horses will do this within a few minutes. Most young horses that I have worked, and I've worked many, many young horses in my life, most of them will start to stretch within a few moments of being lunged, if you know what you're doing. And you're not setting them up by putting over tightened side reins or something else like that, that that would preclude the horse from doing this. So you can still see him right there, see him thinking about he's trying to spin around on me, but I catch him that time. That's why it's so important to stay behind the eye of a horse when you're lunging. But once again, look how every time this horse stretches down, you get glimpses of, of what's going to be possible. And of course, the wonderful thing is, and what I want to show you all, is that you see how this horse is not sway backed at all. This is a Frisian who has in the back problems, and this is exactly how you want to start every horse. So once again, there's no difference between training a Frisian and training a, any other horse. In other words, what we're looking for is exactly the same. Every horse is a little different. So yes, as Nuno used to say, it all depends what we do, but the principles that we are working towards remain the same with all of them. Some, re some require more calming, some require more sending on, like this horse in particular, especially if they've learned to spin out like that. 
So I have to just solve that problem before I go on, but I'm pretty happy with this, how it's starting to go. I've already started to see, see, I'm trying to spit out how hard I have to pull there for a moment to get him to keep going. But I just have to get into that place where he stops thinking about spinning out from underneath me before I'm going to stop here today. Now, once again, this whole session is about 22, 23 minutes, something like that, that it takes to get through all of this. And that's about what I would expect with a young horse. I certainly wouldn't want it to be any longer that. And I actually wouldn't even want this one to be that long if it weren't for this problem that I'm having to deal with. And I just want to get him just once all the way settled so he just stops trying to spit out on me. And then that's all I'm looking for on this particular day. In other words, for him to just keep moving ahead of my leg, which is the whip in this case. Remember, lunging is just riding from the ground once you understand it. Everything else remains the same. We have a rein, which is the line to the horse's mouth or to the cavison or whatever, and we have the whip, which is, takes the place of our leg. And just let him come to a halt and just let him start to walk on again. Now you've also noticed that I, that I didn't do any kind of halt work other than to change directions when I did with a young horse. We don't want to keep stopping them. The, the thing you want to do the least of with a young horse is to stop them up all the time. We see so many people with young horses and they're jerking them up and you know, they're all worried about them stopping. Well, once you get them going over their backs, they want to stop. You know, in other words, they get to that point where they're in the zone and they're listening to you and they're not thinking that they're running away. You know, remember, horses are, are animals of flight. So their first response to everything is just simply to run away from it. And if they can't run away, to defend themselves with their hind legs, which is basically what you see this horse doing when he's trying to spin and kick at me. Once again, why it's so important that we just simply, in the beginning, just establish this simple swing forward. So once again, see how he's starting to give it up here? He's starting to relax the head and neck down. So you can see how he's starting, he's, he's beginning to stop thinking about trying to spin out from underneath me. And that's really all I'm trying to get him to do here today, is just to stop trying to spin to the outside. So that I can then establish some rhythm. As long as he's thinking that, there's no way I'm going to be able to establish a rhythm, because he's always looking for the next excuse to try to take control by spinning in the opposite direction. But once again, we see how the trot, even here, even though it's starting to bounce, even though he's trying to uh, look to the outside, we see a little more flexion in the hocks. He's getting a little deeper underneath himself. But for his first day of work, I'm pretty pleased with this, especially knowing what, what I knew about, uh, and of course what I encountered getting him started for the first time. So that was really quite good. He got to the point where he's moving ahead of my legs. It will take a few days to get that straightened out. But not very many, as you'll see. I say he's been with his with us for about two months. So this was the first day. So once again, you see how he starts trying to stop and spin out. Once again, why in the lunge line? You do not want to have horses flipping around on the end of the lunge line. You don't want to teach them to do that because that just becomes a terrible, terrible habit. So you want to just ask them eventually to just come to a halt and then to a walk, and then I'm sorry, and then to a walk and then to a halt very calmly, however long that takes, without making any big deal out of it, without ever jerking the horse up, I want it to be a healthful experience. So you see by the end of this, he's walking and stretching, and that's what I'm looking for. So I achieved the stretch on the very first day of working with this horse. So that's a lot, and then what I'm looking for in the foundation of everything else. So here we go with the next day of this horse. So once again, you can see how he's starting out. You see how he tries to spin on me there once again. And once again, that's why it's so important to lunge with a lunge line and a long lunge whip, because horses will try to spin at you. I see many people these days that have taken these classes, um, some of this Western stuff, where they're having people uh, lunge with these little short, they really look, kind of looks like a, what we used to call a hunting whip, which has like a three foot long little thing on it, and then a lash on a handle, so to speak, and then a lash at the end. And I see them lunging with way too short a line. I myself have found uh, numerous people um, in round pens with horses that have been uh, one woman who was kicked in the face, another who was kicked in the leg, you know, because they go in and they just get too close to the horse, or they go in trying to uh, join up with them, so to speak, you know, and or to play with them. And I just repeat this again: no one belongs in a pen playing with a horse. I mean, yes, if you're an expert at this and you're doing all this all your whole life, and you're starting with babies that you're training, you know, it's just like all this uh, liberty training and all these kind of things. Well, they're great, and they do well in a circus show and this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's good. It's nice to see that some people can do it, but it's not good advice for most people. That's the kind of thing that, that you, you know, people who do that kind of work and do these kind of circus acts where they come in and they lay down on their horses and these kind of things, just like the guys with the tigers. You know, they start them at very young. They grow them up as pets. You know, they, they begin to manipulate them at a very young age so that they get used to all that kind of stuff. But an average person just going out and trying this that sort of... Uh, 
a thing in a ring with horses. You know, you don't want them on top of you. You want them to respect you and move forward. That's all that's necessary to train a horse. You know, and then they get into the work and they love the work. That's what we want to get them to do, not to love all over us and be on top of us in a ring. So once again, no one should be working with horses unless you are an expert at it. You know, in, at liberty with horses loose in a round pin, because they can they can uh, spin on you as you see even this one doing on the end of a lunge line, trying to do a spin and kick me. Well, imagine if you have no lunge line and no whip, or you have a whip that's three feet long. What what you're going to be able to do, which is very little. Once again, why we see so many people being injured these days by using those techniques. It's not safe. So once again, with a correct lunge whip and lunge line, you're out of the horse's strike zone, and that's where you want to be. You never want to be in it. I learned that lesson when I was about nine years old. My father was always warning me about, be sure you warn the horses before you open the stall doors. And one day I didn't. I slung a door open and said, hi, horse, and it kicked me right in both front legs and sent me uh, flying about 20 feet and I couldn't walk for about two weeks fortunately didn't break my legs but I learned a very important lesson about not getting behind horses and you know not warning horses when you are in their presence you always want to let a horse know that you're coming because you startle a horse almost every horse in the world will kick out if you suddenly startle them because of course that's how they would deal with danger in nature so once again, for the second day of, of lunging here, we can see how much better this horse is starting to go. He's still looking to the outside a bit, but the stretch is getting more consistent, and he's flowing more rapidly forward. And once again, you can see how there's starting to be a little more bounce in the stride. And once again, he doesn't look so much as we think of the typical Frisian with its head straight up in the air. Uh, and of course, unfortunately, most of the people who, who ride the Frisians, that's all they're looking at is what the head and neck is doing. They're not looking at what's going on under them. You know, How anybody can take a horse and, you know, and ride it sway back just be, uh, or just let it become so sway back and continue thinking they can just continue to ride them. Of course, that's where we be, where the beginnings of kissing spine and all this kind of, uh, these kind of uh, physical problems that can end a horse's career at a very young age. So it's so very important that every horse be connected over its back before we put any weight on it. So once again, on this second day, you can see how much better all this is. He's starting to flow forward. Not so much resistant, not so much pulling to the outside. So I'm very happy with this for a second day. So it tells me I did a good job on the first day because this was so much easier. And once again, rewarding. So with young horses, once again, if you see them in the trot, they start to move their heads like they want to go down. Let them come back to a walk and you'll find that they'll go right into the stretch like this. Don't keep going and going and going. In other words, so how we get a horse to stretch in the beginning is what, simply by rewarding that by doing less. As soon as they start to stretch, we back off a little bit. So we reward them for that stretch and let them become comfortable in that. And of course, it, it feels good to the horse. Now look at this horse already. This is only the second day. Now look at his stretch here. That's what we're looking for and how completely different that is. You'll see over these two months from this picture to the latest ones you see, you'll see this horse change in structure a great deal. But once again, his back wasn't damaged to start with. And that's the big takeaway, folks. You know, so many people go out and buy older horses thinking that that's what they need, and in which case, very often they do, but the problem is, you know, if you really want to learn correctly and to ride correctly, just always know that when you buy a horse that's broken in the third vertebrae to start with or extremely hollow in the back, it's going to take a year just to correct those problems. Now, you see, once again, how he tries to load against me and swing and kick out. That's why you must be lunge horses with a long line and lunge whip again there. But once again, he gets back into it, and look how beautiful that stretch is beginning to come. Still wanting to come to the inside. You can see how he's still wanting to position his head and neck a little bit to the outside. That's him, his old habit of thinking he's trying to uh, spin out from underneath me. But he's much better about it today, and we can already see that the trot is much more forward and moving more actively forward. When I first started this horse, he looked very much like a draft horse, so to speak. You know, he looked very heavy and clunky. And what you'll see over these two months of videos that I'm going to show you here today is how quickly that has changed and how beautifully he's moved into it. Uh, begin to work over his top line and how that has already started to develop in such a short period of time. Once again, that's the key to training is that every day we get the horse over its back. That's the only thing that's important. Even if that's only in a walk, if that's all you can achieve, that's all you should do. Once again, when we ride, we want to spend almost no time at all. My, my rule, once again, is for riding horses, I will lunge a horse every time before I ride it, once I start to ride it for quite a while, till, till I'm sure that I can get on the horse and stretch it in the walk. When you can do that immediately, the horse is ready to be ridden without being lunged first. So put that as your rule and uh, your horse will be a lot happier and a lot sounder and you'll live a lot longer. You know, it's the biggest mistake I see people make with young horses 
you know, even like this one is quite calm and they'll get them going, you know, begin to back them and everything seems to be going fine and they think, oh, it's all good. So now I'll take the horse on a trail ride. Someone called me about this just the other day because they took a nervous horse out with two other horses and of course they all ended up going crazy before it was over with and somebody ended up going off and, and there you go. So you must be very careful to take it slow with young horses and don't put yourself, even if you think this is the calmest horse in the world, be very careful about the situations you put themselves in for quite some time. So my general rule of thumb is I would never take a horse out for a hack that I couldn't get on the bridle and over its back in the ring. And if you do, um, one of two things is going to happen. Either the horse is going to go out there and walk on the trail and collapse its back and you're going to do damage to it that way, or you're going to go out there and something is going to go wrong and uh, you're going to go off of the horse and now you're going to have a problem that's, that's going to go on, you know, and take you a long time and probably having to go to professional help to be able to solve that problem. So once again, you see how we just clean up the ring there just to keep that out of there and keep the dust out of there and keep that mud from building up in our arena. So once again, back into the stretch here. Now remember, this is only the second day I've worked this horse. And look how beautiful he's already beginning to go down in the stretch and how easy that was to achieve. So once again, the first day, all I did was concentrate on sending him forward. And that's what you want to do. Even if a horse is, is a, a little um, frantic and this kind of stuff, and we don't want to go on for long, but we have to achieve that the horse will move out away from you and out away from the whip. If it won't do that, nothing else is going to happen. So, you know, I will start to try to horse, work a horse out in the walk, which we often do, and then use the trot and try to maintain that. But if, a horse, if I have a very nervous kind of horse that wants to take off and keep, some will come in at you, You've got to establish that the horse will move away from the whip. And that's what all this first lesson was about and why when I came back for this second lesson, how quickly the horse got to where I want it to go because it understood you have to move ahead of the whip. Now, while it did try to spin on me here once or twice, nothing like you saw in the first video. Once again, remember, this is only the second day of work. And once again, I would have gone to his, to his uh, pen where he lives and I would have tacked him up there with my associates and then brought him directly here. I wouldn't have taken him to the cross ties first. And after the young horse works, then we take him back to the cross ties, then we let him stand, always with somebody holding them for a while till we're sure that, till they just seem to be settling in. Never want to hook horses to a, uh, in a cross tie before you're very sure that uh, they're very calm about it and have, have spent a lot of time standing there, even with other horses in the cross ties as well around them so that you know, it only takes one spook in a cross tie for the horse to throw its head up and feel those things. I've seen him go over backwards in cross ties. I've seen him go over frontwards in cross ties you know, because people put the horse in there too soon and something went wrong and they start to scramble and, you know, their heads are tied up and there you've got a problem. And of course, also why you always want to be sure that you have some kind of quick release uh, mechanism on your cross ties, even if that's only just simply by attaching the final um, clip by just a single strand, for instance, of, uh, of bailing twine or something. So that if the horse, it's much better for the horse to break the cross tie than to end up flipping over because it can't get loose. So always remember that. So once again, coming back, look how beautifully he's starting to walk and stretch, how much easier this was today. Now you can still see how that back leg kind of moves a little bit like it's stuck in mud. We don't have a free flowing walk here yet, but at least we have him starting to stretch into the contact. A little slower than we like, but if I get the stretch, once again, remember training is always a compromise. You're not going to get everything perfect on any given day, you know, and as we begin to move up. So beginning to, as uh, Capitaine Boudin said, and uh, he wrote a wonderful book called Exterior Oticole, which Nuno Oliveira used to talk about how he didn't write a book for years because he thought the best book had already been written, and that's the one, you know. So in his words was it were... Uh, Ask for a lot, be satisfied with a little, and reward often. So by all means, keep trying to move your horse in training, you know, but don't expect perfection and reward the horse often. You know, as soon as I see an improvement in a horse, I stop. I don't care if I'm 10 minutes into the work. If the horse does something better than it's ever done before, like it's never connected in extensions or something, and it does it, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to go do it 15 times. And there is lies the rub with most trainers. As soon as they get thing once, they want to do it over and over and over again. So you still see him, how he finally he managed to spin out on me that time. So once again, I'm just going to calmly come back up here and, and restart. Now, if I had been able to catch him, 
um, then I would have just gone on. But I'm not going to just go there now because he got away with it and beat him all up. I never want to do that either. I'm simply going to go back. He's never going to get to finish until he continues in the right direction without this. So that's what I'm looking for each day here is to get into that place uh, at this point where he just forgets about this idea of spinning out from underneath this. And once again, we're looking for the horse to get in the zone. So I'm waiting for him to get in the zone a little bit to get that place. In other words, where he's not, where I can see that he's not thinking about trying to spin out on me, but just continues to move ahead. Good stretch in the walk there. So the key is that you don't have to punish a horse a great deal for a mistake. In fact, you don't want to punish him at all. You just want to go back and do it again. In other words, don't beat, repeat, as I always say. Just, I'm not asking. As long as you're asking for something that's within the, um, the realm of possibility, that is, and all I'm asking this horse to do is just move ahead of my whip and just stay there and stop trying to spin out. So that's within, you know, that's within the bounds of reality of what could happen with this horse today. But unfortunately, we see so many people trying to force horses to do things, and then they get in a big fight with them, and then the fight goes on and on. So you see with this one, while I may have had to get after him once or twice here, but the fight is quickly over. You know, when you see trainers who are fighting day after day after day, they bring out, and it looks like the same ride. Every ride, they come out, and they start fighting with the horse halfway in when they try to get the horse on the bridle. Of course, that's, why is that? Because the horse isn't over its back. So, of course, it can't be on the bridle correctly. So they start trying to fight him and pull the horse down, or even worse, trying to trying to create phony collection by pulling the neck back at them, which of course does nothing but ruin the horse's real gaits. But once again, remember, this is only the second day I've worked this horse. And once again, had he not already learned this problem of spinning, I wouldn't even have had to have the difficulty that I have here. Once again, why it's so important that you really know what you're doing when you start young horses, because you can create a problem that can take you years to uh, work out. As we were talking about with people who take young horses out too soon, you know, and then they get scared and dump somebody. Well, that's now you have a problem on your hands. You never want to let a young horse know that it can dump people, that that's even an option. As soon as it does, it becomes much more difficult. And, of course, the really smart ones become very good at it once they figure out how to do it. Really good here in that stretch. That's absolutely beautiful. So that's why... That's what I'm looking for. So I know I'm beginning to get there now when I get to that phase where he starts to stretch into it. Now see how he's starting to yield. He's starting to bend a little bit. He's not going to the outside anymore. So that's what I'm looking for. So he's staying out on the rail and he's actually starting to bend in the direction in the stretch. But of course, remember, the horses cannot bend until they stretch their, their necks down and bring the back up because that's what allows the back to free and bend. Remember when we talk about bend, it's the middle of the horse's back we're talking about, not at the neck as we see so many people. It does absolutely nothing to bend a horse's neck back and forth. That's not where we need the horse to be subtle, supple. Almost all horses are supple in the neck unless they've had some injury. They can bend their necks back and forth. But being able to bend in the middle of their back is a whole different story. And when we talk about bend, that's what we're talking about. The bend, the bend that originates from the center of the back behind the withers and bends the whole length of the horse's body. So beautiful here. Once again, this is only the second day. See, I was getting in the zone. Now he's yielded his hindquarters, so he's not trying to spin at me anymore. So that's exactly what I'm looking for right there. And if I can achieve that in two days, I've come a long, long way to training the horse. I've set up... Uh, what will help the horse move forward in the rest of its career. Once again, you see this he's up and down, not exactly in the zone, but look how much better is, you can you can just see it every time he puts his head down, look how better the hind quarters move. And that's what we always must be thinking about. You know, what is the head and neck position doing to the rest of the horse's movement? It's the movement that we're talking about that's important, not this idea of, you know, Horses are built differently, so so many of them get in trouble because people have an idea of what the head and neck should look like on a collected horse, but that depends on the horse. A horse that has a big sloping upward shoulder like this one is going to have a fairly high head set, you know, but it's not going to be exaggeratedly high, even this horse, like the way you see it at so many Frisians where their heads are pulled way back up in the air and then they're cranked over and broken to the third vertebrae, like so many other dressage horses. And you can also see as he begins to stretch how much he just looks more like a normal horse, so to speak, like any of your kind of warm blood. Really good stretch in that walk there. And if I've achieved that, that's just what I'm looking for. He's calm. Now notice how this day, remember we ended, he had yielded his hindquarters to the outside, and that's exactly what I'm looking for. And of course I'm going to reward him in the ring for doing that. You know, a little piece of sugar goes a long way. So now in the next clip we're going to take a look at, we're going to jump a few weeks forward. So we finished the lunging work, and now we've got him 
uh, we have added a saddle onto him, which we started all that in the, in the round pen. And I was able to get him moving at first with just a bit. He was able to accept the bridle. So now we're moving about a month forward in time. And now look how the horse is beginning to move and how it's beginning to take shape. Now still wants to come up and down here a little bit. And once again, look how that affects. Every time his head comes up, look how the hind legs go out behind the horse. But we can already see in just a month's time with this Frisian, you know, who looked like a big draft horse when he came, look how he's beginning to take shape. Look how the belly is already pulled up. Look at that stretch. Look how long that neck is. That's what we're looking for. And once again, most importantly, look at how the hind legs are coming forward and under the body as he stretches. That's what you want every horse to look like. Once again, <laughs> there's no trick to training a Frisian horse. They're trained just like any other horses. They have to stretch forward. And then, of course, ultimately, now this horse it will have a higher head neck position when he's fully trained than a horse like a thoroughbred. Most thoroughbreds, their necks come rather straight out of the body. They're not built to have high head carriage. They're built to be able to plane out in a gallop. So we wouldn't want them to have a high head carriage. But once again, so when after the horse is trained, yes, this horse's head carriage will be higher than a lot of kinds of horses, but we can't start there, and that's the big takeaway. You can't start at the end. You have to start at the beginning of training, not at the end, trying to make the horse look like something that it's not or something that it would be after four years of training. And once again, that's one of the biggest problems that we see in training today is people are, have an idea of what the horse is supposed to look like, and they're simply trying to beat and whip the horse into that shape instead of realizing that a correctly trained horse is... Uh, is brought into a shape by, by developing it. You know, I just saw an article they were talking about all the damage that collection, and never, never anywhere in this article did I see the fact that they were talking about bad collection, and bad collection, bad riding, will ruin your horse. And this idea of what people have come to think of collection as this thing of slowing them down and snapping their knees up. Well, that's the same thing as saddlebreds and Tennessee walkers, folks. I got news for you. So if, you're, if that's what your goal is, you should just go ahead and start riding Tennessee walkers and, and saddlebreds because that's what you're doing. You know, but it's kind of funny because in the saddlebreds, they never kind of, they know they can't turn corners. All they do is go around an oval. And when you watch them train at home, I grew up in Kentucky where those kind of horses, and all they do is run them up and down an aisle way in a barn, going in a straight line, turn them around the other end and trot them back the other way is the typical sort of training that we see back there. Now look how beautifully, now once again, this horse has never had a pair of side reins on. It's never had a shambone on. Now look how consistently it's now stretching into the contact without ever using any of those devices at all because I was starting with a horse that didn't have any problems to start with. Look how beautifully he floats over the ground. So you can imagine what this is going to start to look like. This already looks better than 90% of the Frisians I've ever seen in this country. Look how buoyant he is. He doesn't have that heavy look uh, so much like he, we started with, like a draft horse. Now we're going to go forward another couple of weeks in time, and we're going to begin to mount this horse. So this is yet another day. Of course, we always go through everything. We start at the beginning every day. We don't skip anything, and that's the biggest thing to remember. And that's what the big takeaway that I got from Mr. Oliveira from watching him was the first person that I ever saw train really systematically, where they came out and they built every day in what they did the day before. And really, that's the key to training, once you understand that. So I'm going to come out and do everything that I've done every day up to the point that we're going to start to put a little weight on his back. Now you'll notice starting off here that I have a stirrup only on one side of this horse because when we start to go up I don't want the, the, the stirrup dangling on the outside uh, for safety reasons because all we're going to do is put a little pressure but not go fully up on the back of the horse the first few times we do this. Once again, it's all about it. It might take uh, two weeks. It might take a month. It might, you might be able to get on a horse and walk away the first day. With most of them, it's not a good idea. You know, the first big step can often be a, be a big problem. You have to be sure that we really have the horse in the zone. But once again, look how much this horse is developing. You know, with each week that passes, he's just looking more and more beautiful. So now what we're going to do is start to just put a little bit of weight on and begin to experiment with the... Um, getting somebody above him, and that's the first thing, is just getting the horse used to seeing somebody up above him. So just stepping up on a cross ties, I mean stepping up on a uh, mounting block rather. And just being above the horse is the first step. 
always remembering that the person who's really important in all this process is the one that's on the ground handling the young horse. But I can see with this young horse, I mean, he was ready to do this. He's very, very calm. Other horses might take more time. You never want to try this with a horse that's still fidgety and jumpy. You want to wait till they're completely as calm as this one. So all we're going to do here is just step the weight up there and we're going to go all the way over. Now we'd already done this a few days prior, uh, prior to this where we just got on the horse and just went up in the step. Now today we went all the way over and just put a weight on and just stepped up and got I didn't attempt to walk away, I just got on the horse and stepped off again. <coughs> it's often that first step when you have horses that all of a sudden they realize something's there and you can have them really uh, become quite fractious if you're not careful. Okay, now here's the next time. So here we are doing this again. So we're going to check her girth, very important. Move her hands all over the body of the horse so it feels her up there, just like that. So now why we have gone all the way up before, we're just going to, because this particular day we're going to eventually walk off of them. So I just have her go back to that step of just stepping up, feeling the horse, then we're going to go back and lunge a little more. So I just want him to, be, to understand that the mounting work is just something that we're going to take a little bit at a time. It's just going to be added into what we're already doing. So once again, I come back and lunge him again, get him back in the stretch. So he just begins to take the mounting work as just some, another little step in the process here. But once again, look how beautifully this horse is stretching into the contact. Once again, this is about oh, maybe five or six weeks into training, something like that, six weeks. Still wants to lift the head up and look every, every now and then. Now, he, this, this is a good one because he gets a little excited here. What happened was there's a bunch of horses over in the pen right over there uh, that started running around, a bunch of, of babies. That got him quite excited. And you can see how he thought about trying to pull out there for a moment and how I did just give him a little feel and bring him right back into it. But that's why he's getting excited. And that's what we have to realize. You know, if we'd gone on the horse and that had suddenly happened, uh, those horses running around, he had, he had been perfectly calm in this ring over and over again. Now these babies just on the other side of the rail start playing up and he starts thinking, well, maybe I should play up too. So once again, it's very important that I get the horse all the way back to completely calm again before I try the mounting work. And once again, if a horse ever seems at all fidgety or nervous about you getting, them on, them, get, getting on them, don't because you may end up with a problem. You want the horse to be completely calm before you get on its back. This whole idea, you know, in this sort of old cowboy idea of, you know, breaking horses, this idea that you just get on them and just hope that you stay on, well, you know, that's a really stupid way to go about things because you're going to get hurt. And if you've ever uh, read any accounts of, uh, of the Old West, there's some wonderful books by Will James, who was a cowboy author, and uh, he actually broke every bone in his body uh, during a movie shoot. A horse fell with him on the, on the railroad tracks and broke every bone in his body. And he was in the hospital for two years. And, and that's where he learned to read and write because he was Ill Ill illiterate up until then. And he wrote the wonderful books about his life and what it was like to be a cowboy. He was what, somebody who was really there and the, doing real cattle drives and grew up through all of that, through that whole thing. And ended up as a, as a movie extra and then became the famous writer Will James once he learned to read and write in the hospital after breaking every bone. But you should read his accounts of what it was like. You know, they would start these cattle drives and, you know, every man would be given four or eight horses, you know, that were going to be their horses for the drive. They were completely unbroken when they were started. These guys would have to get on these horses. They were talking about how many people were killed on these cattle drives and, and by getting on these young horses. And it's like with this one, had we been on him that moment before, when those other babies went there, he would have gotten very excited and he would have had a very good chance of having something go wrong. So you notice how I'm just, I've gone back to just getting him completely calm again. Back into the stretch. Always one thing before the next. And the thing to realize is never try to put yourself through the wall. If you can't get the horse to, to relax, just go back to what came before it. In other words, or any, if you can't get something like a flying change, if you can't get flying changes, you go back to working on counter canter. You don't keep working, you don't keep doing flying changes and flying changes. So now that I got him come back down again there, and then we're going to go back and just do this again. So each day can be a little different. Comes out with the mounting block. 
Now, I will point out that Amber did make one mistake there in that video, that she walked directly behind this horse without, without uh, touching it. You do need to be careful about that with young horses. And that was a mistake on her point, part. I avoid the, as I said, I got kicked very badly when I was young once, and I avoid the back ends of horses uh, wherever possible. And so here we go back once again after we got him calmed down because he got excited about the young horses, and went, that's why we stopped on the first one. And he's just going to come back, and we're just going to do this again, just stepping the weight up. Same thing you do there, just putting the weight up on his back like that, a little weight in the stirrup, getting used to You see he's still looking at those babies over there. I'm just going to let him be relaxed about it. I'm going to reward him. If you take a little time, you know, I usually mount horses over about a month because I get on them a little bit, walk them a little bit. I'm never in a hurry, never be in a hurry to get loose on the back of a horse. So now we're back on another day. So just like all the other days, I start him out doing just what we've been doing, which is back to the lunging again, always establishing that. Once again, look how beautifully he goes almost right into the stretch now. Just like that. That's exactly what I'm looking for right there. And look how deep the horse is under body. You can see him already starting to bounce a little bit. You say he's already starting to get his springs on. And once again, we can see because of that, he's already starting to bend. Remember how stiff this horse looked in those first videos. Remember, a horse can't bend until it gets over its back. And no horse should ever have anybody get on its back until it's over its back. So there I've just warmed him up a little bit, and that was just in preparation for the next mounting that we're going to do here. So here we go. We warmed him up a little bit. So once again, he's nice and calm. I just let her step up there. And just let him feel a little weight on his back. And now I'm just going to let him walk off. Now we do this because if you see the, amber, the position Amber is in, she could easily just step down off the horse. That's why you never want to go all the way over a horse and take steps until you do this step. Because believe me, that first step can be a doozy, as they say. And the horse can be totally calm, and then you take one step with the weight on its back, and it just goes right up. So you have to be very careful about it, and this is how we do that. Just a few steps just like that. So it has somebody above it. Now it feels the weight. No big problem, he's off, and he's done for that day. So now, once again, we're going to start, this is another day. So we're going to do the same process again here. So we've already lunged him this day. I didn't show you that. I'm just showing you the next step in the process. So here she's going to go all the way up, leg all the way over. And for the first time, we move off in the walk, and notice he's completely calm about it. There was no problem whatsoever. That's what I'm looking for. So we want to keep these, this mounted work at first just very, very light. So we're doing just a few moments, keeping the horse calm and relaxed throughout. Once again, if a horse seems nervous at all, you should not be climbing onto their back. You should just be going on a step next to them, calming them, touching them. Never get on a horse until its eye is relaxed. If the horse looks like it's about to panic, believe me, you do not want to get on its back. So this is two months of work, just under two months of work here to bring this horse to this from a totally green horse uh, with a little bit of a lunge problem to where you saw him stretching, actively, no side reins, no draw reins, no anything to get his head down. You can see how that happened very naturally. It's Will Faber from Art to Ride with Amber Batusik and Orion. He's going to be a wonderful horse. You're going to see his, his, I think he's going to have a great career. I'm really excited about this horse.